Hello everyone, and um, welcome to this session of the PERMED COE webinar series. Uh, today, Altuna is going to tell us about identifying tumour cells at the single cell level through machine learning. Um, my name is Victoria Hill. I'm involved with PERMED COE on behalf of EMBL EBI, and I'm going to host this webinar today. So before starting, I just want to make you aware that the webinar is being recorded, including the question and answers section. The recording will be disseminated afterwards. Um, and after the presentation, we'll have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Um, a little bit about PERMED COE. It's the HPC Exascale Centre of Excellence for Personalised Medicine in Europe. Um, it focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. Uh, the performance of cell simulation software is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. Um, so PERMED COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale uh, systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. So it will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. Um, first, it will optimize selected cell level simulation software to run in pre-exascale platforms. Um, secondly, it's developing a series of use cases which will showcase the applications of PERMED products in different fields of clinical interest. These include drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient tissues. Additionally, PERMED COE also has an objective training the biomedical professionals in the use of HPC exascale PERMED tools, integrating the PERMED communities into the European HPC ecosystem and building the basis for the sustainability of PERMED COE. So now let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Carlin is a bioinformatics scientist and the head of bioinformatics and omics data science platform at the Berlin Institute of Medical Systems Biology. He's developed computational methods by analyzing and integrating large scale genomics data, and he uses machine learning and statistics to uncover biological patterns. His current work involves using complex molecular signatures to provide decision support systems for disease diagnostics and biomarker discovery. So Altuna, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll share my screen first. Uh, yes, I hope everyone can hear me. If not, please say, otherwise I'll continue. So first of all, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to present our recent work, which is about identifying uh, cancer in the single cell space. So first of all, who are we and what are we trying to do? So our lab is composed of scientists, software developers and system admins. And our, one of the main interests in the lab is to improve drug development and diagnostics using AI and machine learning and on omics technologies or omics data sets. However, to be able to do this reliably, we also need to uh, have reliable, reproducible software for data processing. So we also like to build uh, reproducible and robust software for uh, genomic data analysis, which is, uh, we call it PICS. It's a bunch of pipelines that have the state-of-the-art uh, reproducibility. And we are, as uh, Victoria introduced, uh, based in Berlin, Max Delberg Center. Uh, we also give a yearly computational genomics course. Uh, also, there's a book based on it. So dedicated website to the courses here, covcanmbcberlin.de. And these days, he used to do mails, etc. But these days, everything is announced over the social media. So whenever there's a course, I announce it through my accounts. Um, and the book itself is revolving around R, uh, the basics of R, how to use statistics, graphing, machine learning, etc. But then it uh, gives you precise or more focused uh, applications for RNA-seq, chip-seq, sulfate sequencing, and multi omics analysis. As, as I said, we repeat this course every year. If you're interested, uh, you can check the website regularly or follow me, and I, I will share the 
new course whenever it's ready. Uh, so back to the cancer. So cancer uh, j just in the US costs 80 billion a year to treat uh, every year. And up to uh, 2.7 billion is spent just to develop a single cancer drug and 9.5 million die because of cancer every year. So this is a hugely important problem for the healthcare system and also individuals. Um, and that's why we work on it, we work on it. And one of the main problems is this: it's quite not only cancer drugs, but specifically cancer drugs are quite expensive to develop, and they have very low success rate. So probability of success for oncology drugs is 3.4 percent, which is lower than other diseases generally. And partly this is due to, in general, drug development is a complex process. You have to do preclinical research. Then you have to do clinical trials, which are, which are lengthy and expensive, and you have to get approval, then you have to get prescribed. The approval doesn't necessarily always mean prescription, you have to be in guidelines usually. And on top of this complex process, we don't really understand the disease well and the determinants of uh, the drug response. So, and I'll give you some examples. Um, there's a drug called Sorafenib, they developed as a BRAF inhibitor, which is mutated in many of the melanoma patients. When they run the trial on BRAF mutated patients or melanoma patients, this drug failed. And it, later on they realized, after they developed and after they are in the clinical trials, actually this drug doesn't really target BRAF, it targets most likely another, or is, uh, one of the main targets is uh, the EGFR2 gene or uh, protein. So these examples can be, it's not a unique case. Uh, there is another example. Uh, the authors of this paper took 10 drugs that are currently undergoing trials, clinical trials, and they uh, basically knocked out the targets of these drugs. So recently, I mean, new generation cancer therapies are always targeting some anomaly or some gene. That's why they're precise and that's why there's preci precision oncology. But when they knocked out the targets of these drugs, they see that drugs still work. So there, there is some um, the discovered mechanism of action these drugs uh, are operating through, like the example in Solofenib. And if you don't understand it, uh, you will spend a lot of money in clinical trials on patient populations that maybe not going to benefit from this drug. So how to improve this? So we can, uh, so you have to understand a bit how the drug development work so you usually have a target then you design a molecule or some other entity to engage with the target and then you have to do preclinical and clinical development and then usually uh, cancer drugs these days come with a companion diagnostic uh, so that's also embedded in the uh, sometimes in the development as well so then there are two main sections so one section would be target id and drug design the second section would be drug screening trials and for the target ID and drug design, the questions we have to uh, get better at answering is what is a good target and what's the best way uh, or molecule to engage with the target. And on the drug screen and trial side, we have to get better and uh, answer the question, is the drug safe? And maybe even more importantly, these days, who would benefit from the drug? So not everyone who has a particular type of cancer would benefit from a given targeted drug. It depends highly on the molecular structure of the tumor. Uh, so those things have to be also worked out during the drug development process. So you need to know the what are the associated response biomarkers, if there are any off-target effects, how serious they are, uh, like in the examples I gave you. And if can we tell these things early on? So the earlier you can tell these things, the less money you spend, basically. So normally you have multiple drugs, uh, a company has multiple candidates in the preclinical phase, and the idea is to prioritize them, but if you know these things in advance, you can prioritize that better. So the current answer to which patient would benefit most for a given targeted oncology therapy is more or less panel sequencing, which is a diagnostic where a tumor uh, Biopsy is sequenced and uh, maybe a couple of hundred, maybe up to a thousand genes uh, are sequenced and uh, people look at point mutations, common number variations, fusion events, etc., which are already 
sometimes associated with a given drug. So they are associated in a way that sometimes there is FDA approved uh, a diagnostic or a drug that could be given to a patient who has a certain abnormality in those genes. But of course, this is a bit narrow focus. There are more than, of course, a couple hundred genes in the genome. And they all uh, play a role. Uh, not all, but the other genes also play a role. And what we and others have seen in the field in the recent years is that actually the complex patterns control uh, drug response. So uh, we propose that we need to look at maybe more genes in the genome in terms of their mutation copy number. And we have to at least look at the transcriptome together with these things. And you can add layers of information like proteomics, epigenomics to improve the, your ability to model the response. Um, and so uh, panel sequencing, of course, is a right step uh, or right step in the right direction. Uh, however, 50% of the patients who uh, are prescribed the targeted therapy based on this diagnostic do not benefit from so it could be improved so and the drug response is more complex than just presence and absence of single mutation which is usually the case uh, for diagnostic for the new targeted therapy so if there's a mutation that's associated with the disease you can prescribe it or not but what we are arguing is that it's more complex than that so there's a simple experiment we can do we can uh, take a bunch of samples, it could be cell lines or other entities that could model the disease. And we can look at the panel sequencing on those entities and basically look at copy number of mutations in this handful of genes that are assayed by panel sequencing. And on the other hand, we can also take the information from multiomics, uh, get all the mutations, copy number variations and transcriptome, and use both of these things to model uh, which of these entities would respond or how well they will respond to a targeted therapy. So then we could, can do pre-processing filtering and dimension reduction. And then in this case, we looked at five targeted therapies that uh, specifically target the uh, molecular entity. And we tried to predict uh, which information would give us more ability to predict or more precisely predict the drug response in this five drugs and not surprisingly uh, when, if, when we use multi data the drug prediction accuracies are almost doubled on average which is this red bars here and of course we try to make sure that we don't overfit uh, we apply dimension reduction before training etc so just uh, to give you an idea as I said you can do better than panel sequencing and you can do better drug response modeling uh, if you rely on um, more complex data sets. And we can say also even better results are possible with deep learning. So we also published this recently where we, not, we are not using now off-the-shelf uh, machine learning methods to do modeling or data pattern finding. We now use a custom built deep learning model based on variational auto encoders. Then we can integrate copy number variation, rna -seq. Um, somatic mutations and any other omic data set and then we find these molecular patterns which then are basically non-linear combinations of whatever your input data set defines the molecular patterns and then we can use this as a search engine we can find uh, when there is a new entity a tumor or a tumor model coming to our uh, database we can compare it quickly with uh, things in the database we can use these patterns to do survival modeling or drug response modeling and also we try to interpret these patterns as uh, insights for mechanisms of action or prognostic or predictive biomarkers because we can uh, basically understand uh, what contributes to these molecular patterns and then so it's not a completely black box algorithm we, we have some insight into what molecular features we are using um, so going back to the problem, so on the second part of the problem, if you have drug uh, and related drug screening or trial experiments, we can you know, integrate uh, the data from primary tumors, tumor models, and then we can use this uh, to derive what we call multi fingerprints, which will then help us predict efficacy and also help us uh, 
gain translatable and precise biomarkers. There's an example of this on the project website, arcas.ai. But I think there is more important questions. If you want to improve drug development, we have to also answer these questions better. What's the good target and what is the best molecule uh, or way to engage with the targets? If we take the first question, uh, what is a good target? And this is really associated with what is a cancer cell or what are the discriminating features of a cancer cell. So if we can define this more precisely, I believe we can also define uh, a target that is specifically associated with the cancer cell. So the, the idea of the new generation therapies is that we are trying to not kill everything like traditional chemotherapies, but we are trying to kill only the cancer cells. So it's very important to understand um, what the cancer cell is and what are the discriminating features of that cell so that we can now try to find specific targets uh, for that uh, cell type. So uh, the prediction, uh, cancer cell prediction or malignant cell prediction um, has been difficult because we have been using bulk sequencing for all these years, but with the advent of uh, single cell sequencing now it's possible to not to look at this bulk structure where it has uh, mixture of cancer cells and normal cells, which are shown here in this diagram. But now we can specifically look at each cell at a time and um, use this new technology to define what is a cancer cell. And then we can also use, uh, as the whole premise of this talk, we can also use machine learning to do that. Uh, and why is this important is that, again, uh, the single cell technology is now evolving to spatial sequencing technology, which uh, in the future you can imagine instead of the pathologist looking at a slide from a tissue a biopsy or a tumor biopsy, uh, you can imagine that this slide will be sequenced and then automatically annotated based on cell types. So then there will be a need to uh, quickly annotate the cell types apart. Uh, of course, there is a current, current need because there is active research going on, but also as an application you can think of uh, as a future diagnostic. The other improvement or uh, important thing to do, as I said in the just a couple of slides ago, that uh, if we understand the cancer cell more precisely, we can uh, have more precise targets. Up to now, we had bulk sequencing data, which are the mixture of stuff, but if we now have uh, single cell sequencing data and we can really identify cancer cells in each of the single cell sequencing data sets then this will give us a better opportunity or less noisy uh, signal when we are looking at molecular features to define targets so what we have developed is a framework uh, for deriving pancancer tumor signature and uh, predictor modeling we call this icarus so there are two two sections where we derive the signature, the other section is a somewhat simple machine learning part. So the first part is basically relies on or depends on having good quality single cell RNA sequencing datasets where we have uh, some reasonable um, information on the cell types. So either they are sorted or the, the researchers have run into great trouble annotating them properly. And then we, for each data set, we identify differential genes uh, that define the tumor, uh, tumor cells versus the normal cells, and then we combine them. We, a bit more complicated than this, but in, in essence, this is what we are doing. Then we are left with a set of tumor-specific genes and normal cell-specific genes that are coming from multiple data sets. And uh, first thing is to understand if these signature genes are reliable or do they work at all or can they, are they generalizable. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to do a bunch of computational experiments to sort of validate the usefulness of these signature sets. So first thing, we can take another single cell data set we haven't looked at in this training and see uh, what kind of uh, cells express these tumor specific genes and normal specific genes. So, here the tumor specific genes, obviously, in a data set we haven't seen, are mostly expressed by tumors or tumor cells and some other cell types that may be associated with tumors. 
And the normal specific genes are mostly uh, expressed in uh, fibroblast immune cells, etc., that are not directly related to tumors. And then the other thing we can do, we can look at a data set where authors have laser micro dissected a gastric cancer. So the micro, so micro dissection works so that you can precisely take portions of the tissue slides. And in this case, they uh, sliced it so that there's a tumor, uh, there's a tumor part and a normal part. So, and then they sequenced these parts with RNA seq, and uh, we can then just look at the tumor gene list and calculate the gene set score, like a GSCA or any kind of gene set score you can come up with. Uh, and if you do that, you will see that normal. Uh, Normal, normal cells from the uh, tissue dissection have lower gene set score if you use a tumor gene list and the tumor cells of course have a higher uh, gene set score and again this is a cancer that we didn't use for deriving the signatures we didn't use gastric cancer i think to derive the signatures and if we now look at the uh, use the normal gene list again the normal gene list uh, the normal part of the tumor or the biopsy scores higher than the tumor part if you use normal gene list. So this is one evidence. The other part, other thing we can do is to look at the cell lines from ENCODE. ENCODE uh, database allows you to download the primary cell lines uh, and a bunch of other cell lines which you can annotate based on the origin, if they are cancer or not. So in this case, we annotated, uh, you got a bunch of primary cell lines and then we annotated the cancer cell lines as cancer cell lines and if we couldn't annotate it as cancer cell lines, we just left it as other cell lines and scored these uh, cell lines based on again with the tumor gene list score and these cell lines come again from different, lots of different cancer origins, it's not only the ones that, that we looked at. So here uh, again we see the primary cell lines have of course lower uh, gene set score if you use a tumor gene list compared to the cancer cell line and if you use a normal gene list the thing is of course reversed so the primary cell line has a higher normal gene uh, set score and the next thing we can look at we can uh, look at the patient derived patient derived xenograft samples where again data is available from uh, tumors that are basically grown in mice so you can uh, implant tumors in mice, you can let them grow and you can dissect them later on and sequence them, which is uh, this data source uh, from Novartis has done. And again, we take those data sets and scored each tumor type. So in this data set, there are a bunch of tumor types and each tumor type has multiple samples. And we scored those samples based on the genus based on the tumor gene list and the normal gene list and as you can see the red ones the red box plus are higher than the uh, the normal gene list score so of course uh, again uh, since we derived this we claim that this, these are pan cancer or generalizable gene list so again we see the separation between uh, uh, the scores for different cancer types so now we, if we come to probable uh, predictive modeling type of the framework, we, this is somewhat very simple and it's nice that it's simple and it works. So basically from the tumor gene, tumor cell specific genes and normal cell specific genes, we could, as I showed you, get gene set scores per cell. And then we can use that, those scores to build a simple logistic regression classifier, which gives you uh, probability of a cell being cancerous or not. And then, and this basically cell type assignment shows that, you know, some of them are uh, uh, not cancer, the red ones are cancer and there are some things in between. And then after that we build the nearest neighbor graph uh, and then we propagate the labels based on the graph. So this sort of, this helps us rescue some of the borderline cases. So if they're sort of close in the network to uh, like a 99% cancer cell predicted, they also get higher scores. So this helps us uh, in terms of rescuing the borderline cases. And 
I will show you now how this performs. So this is a neuroblastoma data set. Again, a data set we haven't <coughs> trained the classifier on. We didn't see this data set before. And these are the major cell types. So the red ones are the cancer types and the rest is immune, endothelial, etc. So of course, uh, in this case, we predict quite accurately, apart from some cases, uh, the tumor cells. And of course, we have tried this on a bunch of other uh, data sets that, again, we haven't seen, and this, these are the results. So this is our, uh, our result uh, for balanced accuracy. It's very high in four different data sets that we haven't seen, and we used two data sets. Again, uh, they are not the same data sets to build the signature set and uh, to do the classification. And next, we also tried a bunch of off-the-shelf machine learning methods. It performed poorly. There is random forest, etc., SVM. And the funny thing is that if we don't do this uh, iterative uh, signature finding from multiple different sets, our accuracy goes down. So I think the classifier that we are building is sort of biased towards the cell type, cell type of origin or something like this. So that's why it doesn't generalize. And on top of this, we looked at some other classifiers that also didn't perform so well. Um, so the question we had in mind then, of course, we find the signature. It seems to generalize, uh, at least for the data sets we looked at. But we don't really understand what does it do. So does it overlap with cancer-related genes that already know in the literature? Does it associate with, do they associate with proliferation? Do they over overlap with prognostic factors? Do they overlap with genetic data? So what else can we tell about these this genes in the signature? So we try to answer that question by doing uh, this analysis one by one. So first thing, there is limited offer overlap with known uh, gene sets. So we looked at the cancer SEA database, which has, a, which has gene sets that are associated with cancer. The red one is our data set. Um, I think it is around 130 something or, or a bit more genes. But again, you can see that it's somewhat all alone. It doesn't really overlap with anything other than a bit of cell cycle and a bit of proliferation, uh, etc. So this is not a gene set that's well studied, at least that it's not in this uh, cancer SEA database very much. So the other thing we looked at is that, uh, can, is, are these genes associated with proliferation? So for the PDX data set, we can see how uh, fast the tumor grows. So we can try to correlate the gene set score with that which didn't really correlate so much. And for the CCLE, again, we have the information of the doubling time for each cell line. Again, the gene set score didn't, uh, didn't correlate with the doubling time so much. There is some correlation, but it's not the main effect, I think. The, um, so this is another one. So the title is wrong, but I'll go ahead. So the next thing we looked at is the if the genes uh, are associated with uh, prognosis. So uh, Smith and Schatzler at all, they looked at for each gene in TCGA, they derived a score, a risk score or association with survival score that tells how much the gene is associated with survival or risk. So if you look at tumor specific genes versus the other genes, we see that uh, the tumor specific genes we derived are more associated with survival or with the risk. And if you look at this uh, over different cancers, maybe 70 or 60% of the cancers we looked at have a uh, higher risk assigned uh, to the genes in our gene set or the signature set. The other thing we can look at is the copy number variance. So there, in the COSMIC database, there is a copy number variance associated with tumor types. So we can simply check uh, for each tumor type how, how often our tumor specific genes are overlapping with the uh, cancer specific copy number variant. 
and we can also simulate the background to compare how likely it is this, to, this thing to happen. And over multiple cancers, we see that the red one is our tumor specific genes and the box plot is the background. We see a significant difference in terms of uh, overlap uh, of our uh, tumor specific genes. So, uh, next thing we wanted to look at, uh, which is not in the paper or the draft paper that's online, um, but uh, as I told you in the beginning, we can use such methods to automatically annotate uh, spatial sequencing genes. So there is this next frontier now, spatial analysis for gene expression or omic data sets. And we can, which basically another, as another check, we can get a data set uh, from uh, spatial sequencing and see if we would predict an expert annotated tumor versus normal section. So but that's what we did. So there is a publicly available these human breast cancer data sets. This is the raw tissue image and we asked an expert to annotate it, a pathologist, to which sections uh, she would call cancer, which ones are not. And for these sections, basically everything on this uh, slide, every uh, data point, we run our classifier and this is the result. So the redder the uh, dot, the more likely it is our classifier will call it cancer. And uh, as you can see, we more or less do okay or even pretty good in some sections. So there is hope this can be uh, useful. Maybe it has to be improved a bit. Of course, the expert annotation is not also 100%, but again, it's nice to see a large overlap between the expert annotation and our annotation. So in summary, uh, we have developed this toolkit or framework called ECOROS that discriminates uh, tumor versus normal cells. Um, this Although the initial application is cancer versus normal, you can train it to, to other things probably. Um, and also it's a two-step process. First we define the signature, then there's a prediction uh, step. Uh, and uh, we still are not sure about the significance of the signature genes that we find, because they are understudied, but we can see that they are related with cancer-related things or features, uh, but still um, this requires, I think, a bit in that maybe a second paper maybe to go deeper into this. And also, uh, one of the main applications could be the spatial sequencing uh, of um, of tumor uh, sections or slides in the future or for research purposes. So these are the Basically, more the people who did the work, uh, Bedran co supervised this project with me. Yona, Bora, and Bedran have been involved in the first part where I showed this uh, multiomic drug response modeling parts. Jan and Artem have been instrumental in developing this ECOS framework. Um, so the code is publicly available here. And the preprint is also publicly available, which we're updating at the moment and resubmitting soon. Uh, we got initial set of reviews. And uh, the ARCAS Precision Oncology project is also available. You can look at uh, uh, maybe the demo, you can find it there that, uh, that could show uh, how we can integrate tumor models with primary tissue. Um, and yes, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Uh, and now I'm happy to take questions if there are questions. Should I move to the next? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. We do have a couple of questions, and if anyone else has them, please use the Q and A function at the bottom. Um, so, firstly, why is it that fifty percent of the patients still don't benefit from targeted therapy? Uh, it's a guess. I don't know why they benefit, but I think they don't have the right. Uh, the right diagnostic for those patients. As I said, the diagnostics are very simple and they don't really cover the whole complexity of drug response. Probably that's why. 
Um, and we've got, could you please tell us a bit more about how you score in a PDX, the normal cells coming from the mouse and the tumor cells coming from the human genome? Yes. And how do yeah. you convolate the two genomes? Yes. So that's a bit, uh, I think it's very simple how we do that. It's just that we, all the cells we get in the case, in, in the case of PDX, there is no normal cells. Everything is cancer uh, and when we sequence it and when we when this is aligned to the genome, you know everything from the mouse or most more or less don't align to the human genome. So in this case, we just take the tumor sample that's extracted from the mouse and scored it with two gene sets. One gene set for tumor, which scored high, obviously, thankfully, <laughs> and the second gene set from uh, normal, which scored low. So in the case of PDX, there was no normal uh, cell, it's just that we scored the cancer cells using two different G sets. But in the other examples, there was like a comparative normal, etc. In the case of PDX, there was no normal. Um, are there any genetic markers whose measurements could be used to predict human metastasis? Um, Maybe we, we we may be looking into this, but we haven't done any work that I know of on predicting metastasis. Um, but but maybe in the revision we are going to get into that. And with respect to generalization, is a classifier able to identify cancer cells of a new type by looking at cancer cells of some known types? Possibly, but again, this is a. Uh, so we learned the initial signature from lung and colorectal cancer and then we tried it on i think neuroblastoma and head and neck cancer i think so there especially neuroblastoma is a different i, I, I maybe some experts will disagree but it's not an endothelial epithelial origins cancer but it's possible but it's just that we have to try it and again this is a, one of the tasks for the revision that how if we try this on other types of, um, how generalizable it is. Is it really generalizable for all cancers that we can get our hands on because it's also related to data availability or is it only for cancers from epithelial origin? We don't know, we, we are looking into it. So my guess is we can try, but I don't know what would be the answer. Um, and then we have someone interested in oncolytic therapy and they're wondering how successful it has been in treating cancers and what are the current challenges with it? I have no knowledge of oncolytic therapy. Uh, so therefore I cannot answer. Um, what is the advantage or importance of identifying tumors at the cellular level specifically? Could you repeat that? What is the advantage or importance of identifying tumors at the cellular level specifically? Uh, yes. So at the cellular level, then once we, so one thing is the diagnostic part. So as I said, in the, if you imagine the half of the job of the pathologist is to look at these things under the microscope. But now if with the new sequencing technologies, instead of looking at the microscope or combining the uh, microscope information or pathologist information, we can combine it with molecular information and this could be done automatically because in the end, pathologist looks at the slide and says, oh, these are cancer, these are not. And we can probably do this more automatically and precisely uh, with the new technologies. And the other thing is that if you precisely know what the cancer cells are doing in terms of their molecular mechanism or structure, then you have sort of removed this noise which comes from the tumor microenvironment and more precisely understand what's going on therefore you can target things that are really specific to the, to the cancer cell not, not coming from uh, the healthy or immune cells that is around it which is the case when you take a bulk uh, tissue biopsy and sequence it which then you will there's some loss of signal due to this mixture with your sequencing. And in your presentation, you highlighted the importance of more precise targeting. So do you believe that more precise target ID should be a focus of cancer drugs? 
I think so, because more precise targets will give you less side effects. So that uh, the things that are precisely uh, associated with cancer, if you can target those, or even if there's a cell surface receptor or something like this that's only available in cancer cells, it would help you decrease the side effects that normal cells will not uh, sort of affected by the toxic effects or cytotoxic effects of the therapy. So yes, that's I think, I don't know what, where should be the focus be, but I think it's one of the very important things uh, to find precise targets for cancer. How would cancer cell prediction come into play when it comes to tumor heterogeneity? Because we've seen no cancer is the same as another. Yes, so since this, uh, since these are, I would say, I wouldn't call it universal, but it works on multiple different cancers. Uh, the task would be then find all tumor cells because they have the signature and then you can go deeper in them and sort of substantify them based on other features like uh, lineages, mutations, etc. But then you sort of start with a precise set to play around with later on for the identifying lineages, etc. So that would be, I don't know, if, I don't think that will be affected by heterogeneity because again, we observe them in different cancers, but uh, this is something to investigate. I think if uh, if we have a data set that we can get our, get our hands on and see if uh, does it is it affected by heterogeneity or the signature is still there regardless of the heterogeneity in the cancer. How do you perform segmentation and classification from different cells? And also for the single cell, how do you recognize the single cells? Segmentation, I don't understand the question very well, but uh, we don't do segmentation in the, in, in, in the sense that, is it, do they refer to image segmentation? Mm. Um, it just says, how do you perform segmentation and classification from different cells? Yes, yeah. so I will try to answer it as I understand. So uh, I think, first of all, this method re requires that you have a good, uh, good annotation to start with. So you must have a reasonably well annotated cell types before you start training. Um, so that part is taken care of by the by the known signature genes, etc. So or cell sorting if there is this available for the data set. And then from there on uh, you basically ignore others others other cell types more or less. Um, and you do the classification based on only two uh, two classes, so tumor or normal, and normal will have uh, other immune cells, stroma, fibroblasts, etc. And we don't care about them at, at this stage. You just want to know what is cancer, what's normal. Um, and that's how we do it. I don't know if I answered this correctly because I didn't understand the question, but this is my best attempt. Thank you. Um... What is the application of Icarus in single cell data not related to cancer? What is the application of, uh, of the, Icarus in single cell data when not related to cancer? Yes, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you can use it for any other cell type if you have the rotation and you can train uh, for those cell types. If there is a cell type that's associated with a um, with a different disease, so it doesn't have to be cancer, but it could be any, any other disease that, uh, for example, you want to find subtypes of immune cells 
that are attacking the body itself. Maybe that's another use case. But whenever you are trying to understand uh, or find out uh, specific cell types or learn about them, I think you can use this. Um, there might be disease applications or there might be just research applications. But we are interested in cancer, so that's why we want to utilize this on cancer. Um, how do you plan to improve your tool to better fit the expert spatial annotations? Um, so the, what, what we can do is to uh, learn from more data sets and see how stable is the signature. So also the other side that we, we should also ask other experts because I'm not sure if every expert would uh, uh, section the slide the tissue slide like that so on on one one hand we have to improve the expert annotation i think um, on the other hand uh, we can try to improve our own signature by including more data sets in our learning process which we didn't do uh, for the at least at the time we started doing this there was not so many data sets available Have you compared training your model in a cancer type specific manner versus the pan cancer approach? And do you see differences in precision of tumor cell detection in a selected cancer type? Um, for, the, for the current paper, we, there is some difference, but very little. Uh, in the revision, we are trying more data sets. Uh, maybe the variation is now increasing, but not so high that it worries us. I was wondering how some types of cancer cells, how some type of cancer related cells can be classified based on the tumor signature. Thinking about CF, for example, how they will be classified in your opinion. Thinking about what? CAF. Uh, I'm not sure. We have to try. So if uh, if you have data sets, uh, you can write to me and we can try it. Uh, the main problem has been getting access to these data sets. Uh, right now there are more of them and the ones we can find we are trying. Um, but if there's a data set, we can try it. I don't know of just a, as a guess how it would behave. Um, have you tried or could you observe different gene sets of tumor genes in tumor cells originating from different cell types? Hi. Sorry. Can you repeat that again? Have you tried or could you observe different gene sets of tumor genes in tumor cells originating from different cell types? Yes, there's a difference. And if, if you don't do this uh, merging of different cell, uh, so if, if you, as I showed in the, so that also decreases our accuracy. If you just learn it from one cancer cell type or one cancer type, that, that doesn't generalize. The only thing that generalizes is that when you combine data sets from different cancer types, that is, uh, at least in our cases I showed you, can generalize. And yes, in that case, I think the classifier is sort of swayed to the tissue of origin or tumor of cell type of origin type of thing. And uh, Yes, so the answer is yes, and you have to combine different tests from different uh, cancer types, I think, to um, decrease that effect. And finally, would you consider the wide genomic diversity a challenge to developing tar effective targeted therapy for large populations, and maybe in some sense a factor for why targeted therapy seems too expensive? Yes, the general diversity of uh, different individuals, I guess that's the question. 
Mm, I think the main, maybe, yeah, that's the problem, but also I think the main problem is that usually they, uh, the drugs target the somatic mutation, so um, they are not germline mutations, so they occur with the cancer, so maybe that's less of a concern, but still a concern. And the reason the things are expensive, I think, uh, is not because we are trying to target a diverse population, it's just that uh, I would say we are doing, we, we are pushing too many things that would fail anyway to the pipeline of drug development and that increases the costs and if there was a, a way, and I believe there are ways to do this, if there was a way to uh, to tell very early on uh, which drugs would fail and which drugs don't have the right population, uh, that would cut the costs down, I think, uh, a lot. And that's why we are doing the research we are doing. Yes. Um, well, that was the final question. So thank you very much for talking to us today. No problem, it was my pleasure. And thank you for the invitation and the questions, I enjoyed it. Altuna, could you pass to the next slide just to yes. show the upcoming work? Yes. yes, and this is the next webinar. So you can sign up on the on our website as always. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. All Thank you. Session today. Thank you. Bye bye.